Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with Steve Schenken, who is a nonfiction author I, and for mostly young adult, but anybody would enjoy these stories. He is a three-time National Book Award finalist and a Newbery honor, um, honoree. <laughs> I am especially interested in today in talking about Most Dangerous. This was my gateway book into his books. And we'll talk a little bit about other ones. However, um, Daniel Ellsberg died a year ago in June, June 16th, 2023. And this book brought me so close to the drama of the Pentagon Papers. It was really powerful for me because my dad had nothing to say good about people who protested the war. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, my dad rescued a thousand people at the end of the war. Um, he worked for the CIA in propaganda. They were broadcasting from South Vietnam into North Vietnam in order to try to get the North Vietnamese to lay down their arms and come back to the one true Mother Vietnam. That was the name of the program. So obviously I'm very um, attached to that story because he's my dad, because he saved a thousand people and I'm actually friends with some of them now. And it's almost 50 years since the end of the Vietnam War. Daniel Ellsberg was one of the people that helped bring the war to an end. And yet I know my dad, he had nothing good to say about Jane Fonda or Mike Mansfield. Would, he, and he never mentioned Daniel Ellsberg. Wow. He probably wouldn't have any, had anything good to say. But I love this person, this character, what he did, the whole story of the Pentagon Papers. Um, I'm actually quite a wimp. I have, very hard, I have a hard time bringing out controversial facts. And so I'm excited to talk to Steve Schenken about how did he get into writing about Daniel Ellsberg and how did he feel as he was writing the book? Steve, what did, how did you get into it? Well, thank you. Thanks for the intro, Kat, and for, for having me in this discussion. And that's fascinating. That, of course, I was going to ask you, what would your what did your dad think of Daniel Ellsberg? And, and I guess he never mentioned it to you. Obviously, he would have had an opinion. You know, he would have known about the story. It was such a big headline story. Right. In the early 70s, and everyone, everyone had an opinion. That's that's what drew me to it was that was as a writer of of nonfiction, true stories for young adults, I'm I run up against well, actually I you know, history, me as a kid thinking, oh, the history, is that just where you memorize names and dates? That could be really boring. And so I don't want to write that. I want to write thrillers, page turners. And and when you come, like you say, a fascinating character like Daniel Ellsberg, who, who makes people think he's either a hero and other people, he's a villain, a traitor. Right. Another Benedict Arnold. Yeah. That's interesting to me. Now you know you've got a great story. And that was really... Hmm. You know, as an adult, I that was really all I knew. I just kind of knew him as this figure out there who people had strong feelings about. It had something to do with the Vietnam War and protesting the war and secret documents. And that's really all I knew oh, wow. when I started the project. Wow. Actually, I remember that actually because people often ask me what, you know, where do you get ideas from? And this one, they always, always come from very unpredictable places. I wish there was some place you could go. <laughs> yes, this one came from uh, the initial spark was an article in Smithsonian Magazine, and they were just highlighting odd things they have in the basement, you know, that they're not even on display normally. And it was a filing cabinet. So not the most exciting uh, historical item, you know, <laughs> but it was dented and it looked kind of strange that way. And and it was the story of <clears throat> the break in these these guys from the, the White House plumbers, as they called themselves. Right. It became notorious, of course, for getting caught at Watergate. But they, before that, they had tried to break into the Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to steal what they hoped would be really embarrassing facts and documents about him, Ellsberg, to destroy his reputation. And so they have, the Smithsonian has this filing cabinet, and that story, just that little snippet, there was some, you know, it's a crime story, it's, it, it's secret, it's high stakes, controversy all wrapped up in Vietnam and Watergate. And so that was enough. That 
that little one pager that was really what wow sparked my interest in diving in wow i love that something so uh monumental i think this book and the uh opening the door for so many people into this uh mm -hmm. the reality of it coming from one little um article i wonder if the person who wrote that article has ever found that out or knows because mm -hmm. As That's writers, I you never know where your stuff is going to go. And every once in a while, somebody will say something, oh, something you wrote way back when really affected me. And I'm like, oh, really did it? So the person who wrote that one little page filing cabinet story um, sparked, you know, this entire project and uh, and in a way, this conversation. So true. Anyway, yeah, that's true. Very cool. Um so I notice, and I, I I don't know if anybody's ever said this to you, and I think it's it's a uh, kind of cool. When I started reading this book, I was like, oh my gosh, it's like David McCullough's John Adams. Which, yeah. if you read David, have you read that book? I'm mean, sure you. Sure. I always yeah. feel like you feel like you're in the room with John and Abigail. Like you you forget that somehow he had to do research and pull together different pieces you feel like you're there and I, as I was reading about Daniel Ellsberg I was like gosh I feel like I'm right there you know by his shoulder and um you know copying the papers that became the Pentagon paper leak and being in Vietnam he seeing what he saw and how um uh terrifying it was and brought home to him that that this so just for background for anybody who doesn't know Daniel Ellsberg started out as a hawk he was he was in um he was in all guns go i've talked before about the um tonkin golf incident and how you know there was a lot of as in retrospect it was just a ploy but he he was there at the white house that day working and he just was like we're going to go get him this is it we're in as but this is our signal to uh, go full bore and then he went to Vietnam and spent some time there. And uh, and Stephen, you're writing, you brought that home really clearly. Do you remember what what resources did you use uh, for that? Because I, I remember thinking, wow, some of this, I didn't know if, if uh, yeah. Daniel Ellsberg had kept a journal or- There's a, there's a lot of resources. And if you want to go back and give more of an overview, I don't know how- Oh, sure, why don't you do that? How yeah. much of your, you know, your watchers, listeners have you know, I don't know if you've introduced it's, this story before. Yeah. Um, I never know if people know. Actually, I mean, this book, like I said, was written for young adults. I think more adults have probably read it than young adults because it's it's not meant to really for any particular age. It's really meant, uh, but as an introduction to to this whole story of. Yeah. So how did, what's your uh, short over? Oh, your... man, I haven't done one in a while. But <laughs> I mean, he his story, it's really his story. It's really Daniel's story. He grew up in Michigan. Uh, he's a really gifted kid, super nerdy, super smart, ended up going to Harvard. And then all it just shocked everybody by declaring he was going to enlist in the Marines, you know, and uh, it was like, this skinny kid is totally unathletic. How's he going to make it through even basic training? And he he did. Very determined guy, too. Every Very intense. Everything he did was very all out. So, but he was mostly an academic. He got a PhD at Harvard went to work at the Pentagon. And like you say, he was, he was at the Pentagon. This this you just stuff you just couldn't make up. His first day working at the Pentagon was the day of the Gulf of Tonkin yeah. incident. And so when those yeah, when those reports came in, at first it really seemed like this was an attack on 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 the US military. And that later came into question. But Ellsberg, yeah, he was totally full support, very hardcore Cold Warrior at that time yeah and and that is really important to his story because this is a story of his very wrenching evolution it's just the kind of thing that a novelist would make up when they were kind of following a classic hero's journey mm -hmm. paradigm of a story and he just hits every beat of that in, oh. himself, in his story and yeah like you said he helped work on the war for a couple of years eventually went to Vietnam to see for himself what was going on. He wasn't a soldier, but he's figured, hey, I'm a, I'm a Marine, you know, I could go out on patrol with these guys, which he did and and saw up close what, what they were going through and what they were accomplishing and not accomplishing. And, and very slowly over time, now we're summarizing, but 
began to change his mind about what what we were doing there and what we could really realistically get done and 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 eventually became convinced that we were doing more harm than good and that and and above and beyond that that the government what the government was telling and this is really what opened his eyes is that the, he was what he was getting as an insider was very different from what the American public was getting. And he felt that the people were not getting a clear or an honest report of what was really happening and what, what could be accomplished. What he saw was that presidents, and this goes way back, you could argue back to Truman. Yeah, definitely. All they wanted to do was get through their time and hand it off to the next guy, mm -hmm. you know, and not be the one who lost. Because remember, America has never lost a war. That was the motto. And I'm not going to be the first one to lose it. So let me just get through this and hand it off. And that was really, you know, that's simplified, but that basically was U.S. policy there. And, and then under Lyndon Johnson, that meant sending in hundreds of thousands of really, really young men to yeah. not to win, to, to but to not lose. Right. And to Ellsberg, that was just a... A crime. I mean, what, what they were doing to these young guys and to the people in Vietnam as well. So yeah, I mean, he talks about this extensively. You know, way back you had asked about sources, and it, as a researcher, there's if anything too many. You know, oh. which is a good problem to have. He did a million interviews, wrote his own memoir, lots of uh, lots of video interviews, lots of testimony. And so you can kind of follow his wrenching evolution to turning against the war. And, and the reason he's associated with the Pentagon Papers, it was this top secret report that had begun in the middle of the war. And, and the Pentagon and Robert McNamara said, you know, basically, I mean, it really is cynical, but it, you know, trying to figure out why we're losing this war when we're the richest, most powerful country in the world. How come we can't win, impose yeah. our will here uh, while they were still escalating? And he, he did this secret study of that. And so it was really kind of a secret history of the whole decades long U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And Ellsberg, as an insider, got his hands on this. This was back in the U.S. after spending time in Vietnam and and decided this public has to see this. It may not change everybody's mind, but we're supposed to be a democracy and people don't know the truth. Maybe they'll still support the war, but they have to at least know, know the full story. And so what made him famous or infamous was that, you know, he tried to give it to members of Congress and they, they were interested, even very liberal members. They wanted it, but they were, they didn't have the courage to, to deal in these, they didn't want to be accused of exposing secret documents, you know? And yeah. so they all told him, well, let's get someone else to do it first and then I'll have a hearing about it, you know? And nobody wanted to step up. So he eventually gave it to the New York Times and then the Washington Post. And, and that when it came out, that was what the real, no one had ever heard of Daniel Ellsberg before then. It came out early in the Nixon administration and, and, uh, yeah, it just blew the lid off the news. It was such a huge, huge story. Actually, the the um, if you look at look back at, and I can put a post a link to this if you'd like to share it. Okay, that sure. day's headlines in the New York Times was it 1971? I want to say. I mean, it's funny. I looked. I was like, double check that. Yeah, and, yeah. Let's double check that. But yeah, it was um, 71. Well, it was actually put out in 72. No, sent out in 71. Yeah, he started copying it in 69. And it yeah, did. yeah, he started copying. There, this was thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. I, I think and, we should highlight the fact that you back then, we think now it's so easy to think of copying. Like maybe you put it on a thumb drive and you print it out. No, he had to take every page individually and put it on a flatbed scanner. And then it would... Yeah, the slowly, and then he figured, and it's each page said top secret, and you yeah. he had to, um, then he was cutting them out, and then somebody finally pointed out, put something on the on the, the, the flatbed scanner so it doesn't actually get copied, but so seven thousand pages of copying at you know three seconds a page is mind boggling, and, yeah, and he, in the dark and you know in the uh, covert, and those are the details that make the story. 
what it is, this kind of thriller, those scenes are almost darkly comic because, you know, how do you copy something like that? You can't bring it to the local copy shop. And you know, it was a real conundrum. And he, yeah. he ended up having a friend who's, you know, worked at a, an ad agency and convincing her, maybe if you just let me come in at night, I have this this thing I want to do, you know, <laughs> can I just use your copy machine? Uh, but at the time he had been recently divorced and he has two kids, had two kids and uh, teenage kids. And he was supposed to be, you know, these were some of the days where he was with the kids. And so he brought them to help him out. You know, let's go to work with dad. <laughs> It's just do a little espionage for yeah. And so, <laughs> hilarious. I mean, again, this is kind of funny. It's, it's it's but these are the elements that make such a great story. Stuff you just couldn't make up, and he copied all this stuff. Yeah, and eventually gave it to the Times. And oh, it brought us to the New York Times headline. Is if you look at it, it's worth finding. It has the headline about the Pentagon, what becomes known as the Pentagon Papers, these secret documents. No one knew how big a story it was going to be, but they knew it was going to be big. Yeah. And then on that same headline, it, Richard Nixon is in it, but not in that context. His daughter had gotten married that yeah, day before at the White House. And so it's the only people said basically this is the only time they ever saw Nixon happy. Oh. And so, you know, he was he was just genuinely happy. And oh. uh, and probably the last time, too, because he was just so furious with these secret documents and and wanted to know who did it, who leaked them, mm. and putting together a team to punish the leaker. You can draw you can draw a direct line between that to Watergate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe this was his one happy moment before all of this. Wow, all of this blew up. Like you said, if you didn't know this was a true story and you read it, you would think it's fiction because there's so many pieces like that that just fit mm -hmm. together. And it's even the, I mean, his um, love affair with Patricia Marks, who was um, recently like a peace activist, right? And he's a war hawk. And, and then, you know, that's almost like, how do you, you can't make, I mean, you yeah. could make that up. That's like the perfect love story. But, that's the thing. You could, a really, really good novelist could make something like that up of course you want all right so this is this great epic political thriller well you need a love story too and yeah. so why not here's a perfect one he meets while he's working at the pentagon he meets just just at a party in washington he meets patricia marx this beautiful young woman from new york who's who's a journalist and already an anti-war activist early i mean we're talking early 64 65 and he really falls for her and again, this is just a beautiful scene that that should be in a movie sometime. No one, as far as I know, has ever filmed this whole, tried to make a, you, you couldn't do it in a movie. It would have to be like a 10 part. Oh, mini series. Yeah, that would be great. But he, he calls her to ask her on a date. He just really likes her. And, and she lived in New York City, but she was going to be in Washington. She said, I'm actually going to be in Washington covering this and participating in this anti-war march, the first really big anti-Vietnam war march, was in, which was in 65 and around the Washington Monument on the Mall. And it was going to be a big thing. And so she says, I don't really have time to go out for dinner, but if you want, you can come meet me there. And, and he was really torn. You know, he's like, I'm calling you from the Pentagon. I'm literally planning the war, you know, right now. And uh, but I re but but he also really wanted to see her, so he 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 went, and he knew if he could get in trouble, not that it was illegal or anything, but he was just really worried that he would wind up randomly in a picture in the Washington yeah. Post, you know, at this peace anti-war march. So yeah. he said he spent the whole time kind of like with his head over his head, but and but he just had really really fell for her, and they began this affair, this romance that lasted a, their lifetimes. And it was very much off again, on again in the early days because they would fight so much about the war. And, mm -hmm. but that from a, from a storytelling perspective is just so useful. She's fascinating in her own right, but also you, you can, you know, make these arguments from her point of view. And then he argues back and it's just a great way to get those two sides that the whole country was arguing about yeah story in a really dynamic way right right yeah so that that's just uh um like i said amazing 
true life. By the way, I know I heard some put somewhere along the lines, maybe it was in Saratoga last September um, when you were talking about impossible escape or October. Is there a new word for nonfiction, especially in young adult, like true stories or something like that? There should be. I don't know. I don't know. I always try to use true stories, but yeah. it's not official. I mean, okay. a lot of people have said, I've heard, you know, authors, fellow authors talk about how much they hate the word nonfiction or right. the term because it's just, you're just defining it by what it's not. Yeah. When people think of children and young adult literature, they think of the great novels. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to, the idea is that it's hard to compete with that if you're just doing something that's not that. Yeah. And so I try to emphasize the true stories, thrillers. Right. And, Which and really fits for. for it fits. Uh, it does fit. Yeah, it, it does. Maybe, well, that maybe it'll, it'll catch on because yeah, nonfiction. It's like it's similar to uh, half marathon. I, I <laughs> just did a half marathon, and I was so excited about it. And then I heard something. It's like it's not. It shouldn't be half anything. It's its own race. You know, it's a. It's yes, a, right. It doesn't have Absolutely. to be defined by hard enough. Yeah, diminutive term. Um, yeah. So in when you take this into classrooms. Uh, what what are kids' reactions? I'm really curious because in some ways you, you talk a lot about history and I do too right now, but if it doesn't pertain to the present, then somehow there's no real hook. And the other thing is, um, I mean, he was the quintessential, like became the quintessential anti-war person. And so just in that realm, war is such a horrific thing and you, you do go a lot of your books go into it so curious what kids response is and then how it fits in the bigger picture of our threat of war yeah it, it's it is different when you talk to I mostly talk in middle school sometimes high schools and this is ancient history to them mm -hmm. and so but the hook to me always has to be the story never mind where it takes place first let me just kind of get you hooked on the story and and the stakes, what the people were up against, what they were trying to do. And that really, that re that can work no matter when or where the story is set. And then I weave in all this history of this, this time period that I know teachers want them to know, but in the context of this fast paced story, that's what I try to do. And they, and so hopefully, and it does seem to work, but even when I, when I do talk to, kids, the questions and, and conversations that we have. I just did a, a visit with a school in Maryland just last week about about Most Dangerous. And it was mostly about Daniel and Patricia. They still really focus in on, on that as opposed to the big picture stuff. Mm -hmm. But I know that's all getting through. You know, they're seeing parallels between, say, Watergate and what's happening in presidential politics in the last decade. And, and so they see all those parallels. And I know it helps build context for the world yeah they see around them today right uh, but i still think the, the thing that they really get excited and most curious about are the the people yeah that's such a good thing to know an observation and i love the word context in the sense of um i was capturing my family history and i was kind of like is there a use for this because it would take me a while to do what i called little flash um flash memoirs and my daughter, who's actually so wise, says, you know, what it does really is gives context to whatever. And without it, um, which is, I guess, why it's so important to. It's so important. And, and and as a guy who's been in this history education world for many decades, and I used to write history textbooks, which I usually am embarrassed to say when I'm at school <laughs> because kids, they're just so boring. And so I have to apologize for that. Uh, and, and to me, it was just a writing thing that turned into much more because, you know, I just started researching and finding these stories that that, that I thought could make great books. But what I what I learned from that is that you can't set out to tell kids a bunch of facts. It just won't work. They're gonna their eyes are gonna glaze over. They're not gonna listen. You have to tell a story. Yeah. So what you're doing is so valuable. You tell a story, and they'll learn so much from that, whether they are aware of it right away or not. Right. You learn all this, you begin to pick up, like you say, yeah, this context, this background, you begin to understand the current world better. You can start to see patterns and how things and people behave, how things play out. 
And and yeah, so that's to me, that's the way to teach history is through stories. Yeah. Are you finding a lot more classroom teachers are doing that? Yes, I am. And and that's important. That's how I make a living is by mm -hmm. teachers who who use these books, usually instead of sometimes in addition to because every classroom still has those stacks of textbooks. Sometimes they're just in the corner because the teachers mm -hmm. have stopped using them, which I which is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> kids, especially for my own kids. I have two kids in high school and they still uh, will sometimes bring home those books that are, you know. Gosh. I don't know how they don't all kids don't have back issues from lugging those things around. Right. But right. yeah, hopefully those are being phased out over time. And you know, and and teachers are using more the kind of books that we do. Yeah, the true stories. Cause yeah. Um I what I wanted to um know if the story of Ellsberg inspired you at all. Um very much so, yeah. And 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 this is the other thing I love to tell kids is that it was recent enough, and it's really the only book that I can say this about that I've done, I should say, where all the all most of the main people in the story were still alive when I was researching. Oh wow! You know, about starting about ten years ago, so I was able to meet and talk to a lot of the key people in the story. Most importantly, of course, Daniel Ellsberg and Patricia, as well. And and a couple other of the key people too. But wow. I, met, I met Daniel's son, Robert Ellsberg, who's who was involved. Like like I said, he was I think fourteen when he went with his dad to uh, the copy shop. Gosh, wow. his dad, he just wanted to be with his son, but he also wanted this kind of quite profound and heartbreaking is that he he knew that he would would be in trouble, Daniel. Oh. He didn't know how big of a trouble. He knew he would get caught because he wasn't going to keep this secret and he wasn't going to pretend someone else did it. He was going to take right. responsibility. And he figured he would go to jail for the rest of his life. And he wanted his son to know why he was in jail. Wow. And and I think that's really moving. That is. It's also terrible parenting, though, because... <laughs> As his ex-wife, she was furious. He said, oh. Daniel, you don't take your teenage son along to commit felonies. Right. And that's also um that's also true. So, you know, I love that that mix. That's that's part of his any great figure in history has that complexity. Yeah. Like any great character in a novel and, and mm -hmm. uh, he's all of it. I mean, he's almost Shakespearean in that complexity of his character. So yeah, getting to meet those. Those people yeah. and definitely being inspired by him. He, even like you said, he lived till last year and was feisty as ever, all the all the way. Yeah, all I'll post a link. Way. He just did a, a like I think it was just a months before yes. uh, saying he would come out and be um advocate for Snowden, Edward Snowden, who was yes. um getting information uh, out and so right there on on TV and the broadcast, the interviewer actually said, "Wait a minute, you just like implicated me as, as <sighs> being." A, he wasn't saying that actually. So Ellsberg was going, "Oh no, I'm sorry, I didn't get mean to get you involved. Maybe he was thinking of his son <laughs> still." <laughs> yeah, he was an intense guy, and I was very, yeah, definitely inspired by him. That's another thing kids ask: is do you, do you have a point of view? It's but you can tell from reading the book that I do. I don't mm. try to be objective. I don't think that's possible or honest anyway. Yeah. So you can tell that I support what he did without thinking that he was perfect in any way. Yeah. And and that comes through. That definitely comes through in the book. Though I didn't want, again, I didn't want to portray him as this heroic figure only because I think there are a lot of complexities there. And so when I wrote it, I was actually worried what he would think because he had done a lot of interviews with me and 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 I know he was very wary. There have been some real hatchet job kind of books, uh -huh. about him, you know, and, and and so he was worried about it. And uh, so I, I was nervous about that. And, but he, it turns out he really liked the book from what I from what he said to me. He said, I, he, when I when I meet somebody, if this is what he said, if I meet somebody and they want to know what I did, like, why are you famous? I don't get it. What did you do? Mm -hmm. he, here read this and i'll give give them oh my, really yeah oh that's great that's kind of funny yeah 
Yeah, I think if something, well, hopefully he appreciates, you know, if something's written too flatteringly, then you're, then it's falsified somehow. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. But it's interesting too, uh, thinking of kids and how, look, it's, it's ancient history in a sense, but it's also, it's far enough away to look at without having to be feeling too connected to it. But sometimes what I don't like in our current um, way of, uh, consuming media in a sense is it's often hard to find people who share the complexities. There'll be stories about how great this is or how terrible it is. And yeah. it's never like that. There's always the 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 gray area and I, nobody's all good and nobody's all bad. And circumstances are always more complicated than they look on the surface. So. That's so true. Yeah, we've definitely lost that. Definitely in our news reporting yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, so uh, books like this and the, the um, uh, yeah, I, I was trying to think of back when I was reading it, if I had that sense of, no, it's just, it's so real. And that part, I remember the part about, I think I probably went, Shh, what he's like, he took his son to do this. And I was like, oh, that's probably bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, probably um, bad. So, um, yeah, so a complex character, but the the thing that I kind of turn to in these days and I, when I said I, sometimes I feel like a wimp you know you see something that isn't quite right and you're like should I step in and try to change it or you know take a big stand and um, I think we're all kind of faced with that one way or another but uh, he he was in that opportune moment of wow I have my hands on these top secret files I could go to jail and yeah. you know, my option is to uh take out those first few pages and uh, do what's right. And and he had seen the suffering in the war, which um, was a powerful motivator. I mean, a lot of people were motivated to protest the war, um, but he was the one, he was like the linchpin in that one spot. Do you remember, did he know at that moment when he was gonna smuggle them out that it was gonna have such a huge impact? I don't remember. I think he hoped it would. And really, I mean, his goal was to to end the war, basically. I mean, yeah. And and you can't really say that he did that. I mean, that it it became part of the conversation. There was a huge anti-war movement as well, yeah, going on that inspired him, right. And he was very much inspired by 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 those protesters, especially um, you know young men who would go to jail. Instead of being drafted, which is kind of it's that is just interesting in its own right, coming from this guy who was so hawkish and who had yeah. who had served as a Marine and and very much believed in that service. But then in this case, he also really admired people who took the opposite. Right. So proud. So yeah, he definitely was hoping it would have this huge impact. And when you look back at the news. And how it played out, it it was kind of, it took a long time. I mean, it was a big deal when it hit the newspapers, but it also continued over several days. It really has every, I mean, we keep coming back to this. It's every element of this, of a thriller. And he was leaking it little by little. And like you say, nothing could be done on flash drives or anything. Everything is handoffs, like cloak, for a lot of cloak and dagger scenes and handing stuff off and parking lots and parks and city streets, a lot of pay phones, meet me here. Yeah. All the great elements of a spy movie. And so he was copying stuff using, he he was hiding in and around Boston this whole time. And he was using basically just grad students and, and people in the activist movement in, in Boston who would help him with the logistics of handing this stuff off first to the New York times. Then when Nixon went after the times and got them to, stopped publishing, he gave it to the Washington Post, and then lots of Boston Globe, lots of other papers, and and the Justice Department went after them one after the other, getting them injunctions to stop printing, and then they would just pop up in other newspapers yeah. all over the country eventually, and that played out over a couple of weeks, and he was in hiding the whole time, and this was one of the biggest manhunts in history, you know, trying to find out who was this, where was this leaker? Where is he hiding? And he was in just in basements in and around wow. Harvard and MIT all that time. And 
And uh, it, but then eventually, and this is something he did that I think is so important to his story. And one of the reasons that really won me over to him is that there was all kinds of speculation about who had done this. Mm -hmm. And no one had any idea it was him. I mean, a couple people, you'd have to be real, real inside yeah. the scenes in the Pentagon and, and other places like that to even know who, who this guy Ellsberg was. And, and But he said, when when I'm done, when I've got everything out to the papers, I'm just going to turn myself in. Wow. And that and that is, again, a really dramatic moment of what he did. He just walked into the courthouse in Boston and, and was arrested and and was charged with really serious crimes, you know, in espionage act type crimes and, uh, and faced 100 years in jail. But I think that's really important. I think I think. Yeah, he, he saw it as a, an act of civil disobedience. And so his heroes like Gandhi and Martin Luther King, these guys were arrested. And yeah, that was part of it. So he felt that, all right, that's going to be part of what I do. And I feel like. Though he would obviously disagree, but I feel like that's exactly what Snowden didn't do. Right. That's true. And I feel like Snowden really undermined his own credibility to a large extent by going off and and hiding in Russia of all places. Right, right. And that you're not it's not the same, man. If you're gonna do this thing, you gotta do it do it all the way, which is yeah. again, Ellsberg, everything he did, he did he did right. all the way. Wow. That's a powerful observation of uh you know standing true to what you um, yeah. um committed yourself to. Yeah, and he really committed himself. Definitely. And he really, it really looked like he would go to jail for. I can't remember what, how did he get off? Of um... uh, I mean, you just, it, it's just, it's so fun to go through this story again with you because I'm remembering things that I haven't thought of in a while. But yeah, so all right, Nixon was furious, even though the, the report didn't even cover his administration, it ended with Johnson. So he could have just said, look at the terrible job all these other presidents did, and I'm the one who's, who's going to end the war. Yeah. Have been very, I mean, of course, that would have uh, been the right and calm and rational reaction. Yeah. <laughs> it was more like, who is this hippie? And I'm going to get him. I'm going to get this SOB. Yeah. And the One of the problems that he would later have is that he recorded all of that. And right. you can go online and find it all. It's all online, uncensored. Oh my God. And so I'm going to get this guy. And so he put together, and of course, his team put together these guys called the plumbers and the most famous ones were G Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt and these guys who became famous later <laughs> and they called themselves the plumbers because they were going to fix leaks and it all started with Ellsberg and so they're going to get Ellsberg and their plan they, it's outlandish they were going to they were going to slip LSD into his, his soup at a at a dinner so that he would appear wacky and say crazy things they're just gonna just really silly stuff but but it's real and and one of the things that they they were very excited when they found out he had been to a psychiatrist so they said all right well the guy's got to have notes and he's got to be like telling embarrassing stories about who knows sex life drugs who knows what private stuff is in there if we could get that we'll turn the tables on him and we'll leak that to the press and see how he likes it and so Hunt and Liddy came up with the idea of going out to L.A. and and breaking into the doctor's office in the middle of the night. And this is the opening scene of the book for me. Yeah. That's the tone of what kind of story this is. Yeah. It's also a kind of darkly funny, funny scene because they're kind of bumbling Keystone Cop kind of uh private eye. They, I guess they would they called them, they would think of themselves as these. The detectives but they're really kind of obviously criminals and and they're using disguises and, and fake limps and all this stuff and, <laughs> and they broke they really did yeah i mean how many spoilers do we want to give i guess we're just giving spoilers but they, yeah they really did break in but it relates to the it relates to the ellsberg's trial because he went on trial also in california and and was facing these very serious charges and all and in parallel, uh, Watergate is coming out too. These guys, 
the plumbers, they all right, they they did break into Ellsberg's doctor's office. They did steal what they could, but the doctors didn't take the kind of notes that they were looking for. So it was kind of a a, a loss. They they didn't find what they were hoping for, but they didn't get caught. So in that case, they figured, hey, it worked. In their mind, it worked because they got away with it. Yeah. And it was blamed on some, you know, someone coming in looking for drugs or something. And they just the police wrote it off. Didn't seem very serious. But then these same guys, they said, well, what else could we do? Now we have this. We're really good at breaking in places. What else? <laughs> what, where else should we break in? Oh, my God. And again, this sounds so funny, but uh, yeah, they they decided to break into the Democratic offices in Watergate. Imagine the kind of stuff we could find in there. And there are, there are you know, place bugs in there. And that was a total, even Nixon thought when he heard about it, this has got to be a joke. Right. Now, this sounds like something out of a B movie. Who are these guys? They're idiots. Who are, what, what is this? Oh, it's my a God. of errors, he called it. And uh, But it was. And, but eventually, these guys got, as everyone knows, got caught. And and so when that story was coming out, it came out that they had broken into Ellsberg's doctor's office, too. And, and all of that was coming out while he was on trial. And of course, just because it was Nixon's guys, they had to do bumbling things and they would they actually went and tried to bribe the judge. Oh, right. right. Um, so, yeah, they just tainted the evidence to, to an extent that the judge had to dismiss the case. Yeah. And so he was not sent to jail. And, and in, in a crazy way, they ended up the plumbers and, and their wacky adventures ended up. Right. Um, helping him not be uh in not be charged or rather convicted of these which he, he felt he he really felt he was probably going to be right right and that like under law in a sense he could it was would have been lawful for him that to happen it was pretty clear that he had he had broken the law he he, yeah. he admitted that for sure so yeah. it's interesting because they uh and the the part i love the part about the LSD, especially, they were going to slip it into his drink. The way you write it is great because I, so I've read this book a few times and I was just rereading it to, uh, to freshen my mind. And I was like, oh, I'd forgotten. You make it, you don't say right away whether the LSD got into his drink and then Ellsberg stands up to speak. And as a reader, you're not sure whether he's actually going to to just like break down as in on the microphone and then. He, he ends up doing a good speech and then later it's revealed <clears throat> like the next paragraph it's revealed that they the um the uh the help the the staff that they were going to hire who was going to slip the lsd wasn't it was like so these small ridiculous logistics right, right. things you know and, and when you said they thought they were so good at this it really reveals in hindsight that they were not good at all and they just were um kind of full of themselves so that that was uh <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, and the, the way the book opens with the limp is, um, you know, he's got this big, huge piece of lead in his shoe to to assimilate a li simulate a limp. It just, it was like over the top, really. It was, again, but it's all really well documented. Very, so. Yeah, very comical. And yeah, yeah, really. Right. Luckily, it's well documented. Otherwise, it would be like, you'd feel like you have to like, yeah. justify how you're here. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the thing about and Ellsberg, so he wanted to end the war, which is fascinating that it wasn't really the release of the Pentagon Papers, but then it was the investigation into him that led to Watergate, which led to Nixon resigning. And that was in August of 1974. And that was really when everything fell apart. And the North Vietnamese were like, we, OK, we, we've got it. They went and they took Fuok Long in early December and the United States did not retaliate or respond at all. And they were like, oh, we got this. And actually the North Vietnamese had not, they planned to, you know, take a few couple more years to see what they could do. They were not giving up by a long shot, but they thought it was going to take a little while. But that progression of events gave the, the um, leaders in Hanoi just like, oh my gosh, we've kind of got a green light here. And um, so so he did actually <laughs> initiate uh, to use the uh, domino theory. He knocked over a domino that led to other ones, but not the way you would think. You would think, hey, we've got these papers, we've got to take action. Right. And um, it was not that way. So it's interesting, kind of back to the filing cabinet thing, that person probably didn't know that they affected you, which created this book, which 
created this interview and hopefully more people knowing about Ellsberg's. I think that's the theme of the whole story. And because you never know, you just never know what effect, but that's, that's no reason not to try. And, yeah. and one of the interviews I did was with this guy named Randy Keeler, who was an anti-war activist who, who gave a speech that really impacted Ellsberg oh, wow. when he was on the fence about what do I do with these secret documents? And Keeler was had, was about to be sent to jail for oh, right, right. for refusing to be drafted. And and I talked to him and I asked him, I said, did you have any idea, you know, just to bring the ripples even farther back that this speech you gave, well, that was the moment that Ellsberg had this epiphany that he had to do this. He had to do it no matter what. And uh, and Keeler said, that. no, of course, I had no, no idea. But if you, he said, if, if, if you speak to young people, tell them, tell them the story and tell them what I've learned, which is that you, you just never know. Don't let anyone tell you that what you're doing is small because no one could ever know how it will ripple out. And I feel like that was, that's a really good, the most important message maybe in the whole, in all of my research and, and in the book the whole thing yeah thank you that's excellent and I have to say I did say this was like my gateway drug into Steve Schenken novels um so before we go I want to mention a couple other things I was really because this has to do with the Vietnam War but of course before the Vietnam War we had um a few other things that happened um your book, The Bomb, I found very, um, I couldn't put it down. I was actually listening to an audio book and I forget what I was in Schenectady. I think I was supposed to do something somewhere and I ended up like walking laps around this building oh. till I got to a certain part. But um, I bring it up because somebody once told me that it's often the people have been involved in war. And since I was in Vietnam at the end of the war, it was never my intention to like grow up and write about the war. In fact, people would tell me you should. And I'd be like, I, that's not something I want to tackle until it became clear that I kind of had to. Um, and, but she said, you know, it's the people, certain people who've been affected by war, the kids of, uh, um, are the ones that end up being like the anti-war um, proponents. And I was like, well, that's a good thing to be <laughs> anti-war. So I just wanted to put a plug in for the bomb and I haven't yet um, read the other one that has to do with Cuban Missile Crisis fall, fallout. Fallout, yes. And, um, I just say, just because the way your your writing is so close to the subject, it doesn't feel like fact. If it, it feels like a true story that you want to know more about, so I wanted to just um, say, you know, we really I don't know how we really got to tackle and get rid of this war thing. It's just absurd. Um, and so books like these do there's that element of espionage which is really cool and exciting but um let's yeah let's get them into the the uh novels but we have to go through the true stories first and then last oh go ahead you're going to say something no no i just say thank you for uh i think we're on the same page in terms of the importance of these true stories so it's great yeah. it, it's great to hear that that's the best review i can get is when someone gets caught whatever age they are gets caught up in the story and and because that's just not something you typically associate with history, yeah. especially young people don't associate that with history. So if we can yeah. do that, that's a win right there. Right. Yeah, I mentioned Dave McCullough, which if people haven't read him, I mean, his books are usually this huge. Yeah. And they're, although the audiobooks are often really good, um, but that can be daunting. Um, this sure. is a, yeah. a lot more uh, accessible. Um, and then I just wanted to speak briefly about Impossible Escape, Impossible Escape, because um, I read that last year right after the Saratoga Book Festival. Mm -hmm. And um, another, I've always been really deeply affected by the Holocaust, although, of course, not familiar with through my family or anything, but just um, through reading in high school and things. I'm like, how how is this like possible? Mm -hmm. And and I, and I think you mentioned it in one interview that I hadn't heard of Rudy. What's his last name? Verba. Yeah. he is the one that got the word out that changed everything that got I kind of like Ellsberg in the sense of getting the word out that's true uh, yeah I never thought of that there's was... a there's a similarity there yeah he was a Jewish teenager from Slovakia who escaped from Auschwitz it really was thought to be impossible and so yeah it's just I just as a 
even beyond how important the story is and all of that, I just love escape stories. Again, looking for those exciting page turning stories. And this was the highest stakes, most difficult escape you could ever imagine. And and yeah, he did. He did make the first eyewitness account from from inside, you know, what was really happening inside the gates of this death camp and that had a huge impact. So you're right, there are similarities to interesting Ellsberg's journey as well. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody who's um, looking for a really good story, all of these are great stories. And oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really neat to uh, see things brought to life. Oh, and I just have to put in one more plug for Benedict Arnold. Um, mm. That's another one I really liked. And it's so funny because um, uh, so S Steve lives in upstate New York, like myself, and there's a, a Saratoga battlefield. And because of the book, and I've been to the battlefield before, I just happened to be there and I drove around and I saw um, Benedict Arnold's boot, which <laughs> was, it, it's just this little statue. And it's just, I, I love how books and writing can bring the unseen to become the seen. And then you have this experience with it. And um, so I'm always hoping with my writing that somehow people get connected to the Vietnam War because I think it was the, the era because it was just such a big turning point in our country. And um, so as I move forward, it, uh, it'll uh, be fun to keep Daniel Ellsberg and the story more in mind and, and how to bring things alive that way. So, okay. Thanks so much for being here today. And any other things you want to add in or? No, I mean, I can tell you just one final story because it all brings it, it brings it all together is when, when I was trying to contact Daniel Ellsberg, it wasn't so easy because he, he doesn't know, have any idea who I was. And it was during the Snow, Snowden story was just breaking. And so he was on the news a lot and I guess was pretty busy. And, but I eventually got his phone number. I couldn't, get through, you know, you couldn't reach him through email. I don't think he did email very much yeah. or social media at all, as far as I could tell. But I was able to, so I just called him, which was kind of uh, a little <laughs> scary because he doesn't know who I am. And I'm going to, and he was really, he was brusque, you know, what do you want? What do you, want? you know, he was just kind of, that was, I think his personality anyway, or he came off that way. Yeah. And, but I, I talked at least a little bit. I'm writing this book and I really would love to interview you. And he wanted to see other books that I had written. Oh. You know, just to see if I was a serious guy, I guess. And I started, so I started showing him some of the books and he saw, oh, you wrote a book about Benedict Arnold. Uh, send me that one because a lot of people compare me to Benedict yeah. Arnold. Oh, interesting. And uh, yeah, so he wanted to see that. And, and his opinion of that book, I think, really helped me because he, I guess he liked it because he, Next, when we talked again, he was more open to having a conversation and, and telling me stories. And that's great. I feel like even though, he, you know, it's not the kind of person you want to be associated with necessarily, you know, this person right. own basically only as a trader. And again, like we said, complexity, there's so much more to the right. story. He, I think he liked being in the conversation in that way, you know, in, 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 and and being uh, remembered as a really interesting figure and controversial figure in history, which he definitely deserves to be. So yeah, it's really great that I, that sending him that book, which was the first of these narrative nonfiction books that I that I had ever written, got me the access to to talk to him and write what most dangerous, which is I think my most ambitious book. So that kind of brings the story a full circle and in a satisfying yeah. way. Wow, that is fascinating. That is, yeah. And also, yeah, when I read Benedict, the, the notorious Benedict Arnold, right, I, I was yeah. shocked to realize that, yeah, he didn't start out as, he wasn't born as a traitor. There's not a lot more not to the story, you know, which is what you get in school, this sort of this. I know. Yeah, he was a great hero. We don't have, we need thing. hours and hours to, to do his story, but yeah, but yeah, that, the complexity. Yeah. Yeah, and so we've had this conversation today, and I'll I'll post it when it's a little closer to his his um an first anniversary of his death. And um, you know, it's interesting to think neither of us really know where this conversation will lead other people and right. what it might bring, what what might ripple out from it. So very exciting to be part of history. Yeah, yeah. that's a beautiful way to to close those ripples. Who knows? Who knows? Here's where they'll go. All right, Steve, thanks so much. Thank you, Kat. And everybody, you can take care out there. Thanks. Bye-bye.